welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my colleague Chris Collins. Together we bring you tips and advice on how to grow the organic way. Now, what have we got for you this month? Chris and I talk about weeds and those lovely plants called green manures. We have not one, but two interviews for you on the theme of garden centres. You've probably visited one recently, but have you thought about how sustainable they are? And our popular post bag includes questions on seed sowing in July, how to look after your plants when you're away on holiday, and the dreaded carrot fly. You probably never even noticed them, but really they can render carrots inedible. But first, a big thank you to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. They're proud to offer a complete range of organic gardening products from seeds and plants to equipment. This month, they suggest looking at their organic pest controls, such as their range of nematodes. Check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. Okay, so I've now got the kettle on and I'm off to meet Chris in our virtual potting shed. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good, Sarah. How are you? I'm very well, actually. I'm very well. I've got back from holiday and I'm ready and raring to go. I found weeds everywhere. Absolutely (laughs) everywhere. Yeah. It's not just the things we want to grow growing at the moment. It's the things we don't do. That's the thing, isn't it, with this time of year? (laughs) You're absolutely right. And in fact, Chris, I value your advice. I have a small herbaceous border. It's not big. And last year, I noticed there was a little bit of ground elder in it. This year, this summer, it's rampant and it's spreading across the border. Now, my plan is obviously I can't do anything about it now because all the flowers are up and looking good. And I've had lovely irises. I've got phloxes. I've got all sorts of lovely things in there. But my plan is to dig that bed over completely this autumn, take out the plants that I want to keep, the lovely flowers, comb through their roots, make sure there's not a hint of a ground elder rhizome or root in there, and then pot them somewhere quite separate for the winter. Then on the now empty bed, I dig out as much of the ground elder as I can to get rid of it, and then put down a thick, thick layer of homemade compost, like a big, thick mulch, at least 30 centimetres thick, and then leave it like that for the winter. Do you think I'm doing that right? I think you are to to contain it. That's the thing. I don't think you'll ever get rid once you've got ground and a bit like my horsetail on the allotment. I've had periods where I've left a, an area lay, put down compost, put my picks down, put compost down. It still tends to come back, but you're doing the right thing by trying to contain it. You have to kind of live with it, Sarah. That's that's what you have to do. But also you're trying to do two jobs at once in a way, because herbaceous plants really benefit from being lifted divided and put back every sort of three years anyway so you because they tend to get old a bit gnarled it's also a great way you can give some away to your neighbors or your friends so you know they've got some if yours dies you can go and get it back again so actually you're doing the right thing to contain the ground elder but also you're kind of reinvigorating your herbaceous planting at the same time and really there's I mean, to be fair there's not much other options going about it that way anyway yeah it's good to hear and the year before it was bindweed i mean you know <laughs> these things are sent to try us but <laughs> But what I did find was that by putting down that thick mulch of compost, when it came to the following spring and things started growing and I put the plants back into it, it was so much easier to pull out that bindweed because the soil was so lovely and loose and rich and, and loose textured that it was like, oh, pulling the weeds out was like pulling cooked spaghetti out of a bowl. You know, it was it's, that easy. It's kind of good for animals. The problem is you have to make people aware of is that things like bindweed, horsetail, go down a really, really long way. So I think what I do with horsetail is at the moment I've got a big patch of potatoes and you can see it comes up as feathery shoots because it wants to come up for the light. So I tend to pull all that I can't get it all out, but I'll pull as much as. And you're right, a lot of get nice big boot. I call it a boot lace off the bottom of it because it's got that thick, thick sort of brown sort of root, and that pulls up. And that what tends to mean it, it has to come up from a bigger depth, and then it comes up as prostrate. It won't come up as the big feather. So then my potatoes are starting to shade it out. So it really is a case of living with it. You know, you have to kind of live with these things and, and you develop techniques to keep them at a minimum rather than you'll never really eradicate them. Even if you were the biggest pesticide sprayer in the world, which is the last thing we are, 
you, these plants will still prevail. That's just the nature of things. They are they're hard as nails, and I quite admire them in some ways. But as long as they don't uh, undercut my yield too much. Yeah. Well, I think that's <laughs> the thing about weeds. I know we bang on about you know keeping on top of them and not letting them go to seed and spreading and whatever. But the truth is, the reason we do that is if you do have too many weeds in your plot, whether it's vegetables, fruit, or flowers. They're competing with the plants that you want to grow and they're taking the nutrients out of the soil. They're taking the water from the soil. They may well be shading the plant so it's not getting the light as well. So it really, really is important if you can keep on top of those weeds where they're competing with your precious plants. Yeah, it's true. They also can be vectors for pests and disease. You know, they can bring in mildews and molds and stuff like that. So you do need to have a balance. I know there's a, a, a movement now that we can be very free about weeds. And in a little way, I agree with that. I'll give you an example. My hardy annual ball is my, my, what I call my pollinator corridors, which I put through the allotment. I don't mind if there's a few dandelions in that because they'll put up those flowers early in the spring. The bees will join them. But I can't have a massive load of horsetail coming through my potatoes because I won't get potatoes. So you need to pick your battles. That's the, that's the key. I'm reminded of an earlier podcast that we did with Jack Wallington, and he wrote that wonderful book about wild with weed, growing wild with weeds, and he calls them rebel plants, and I rather love that terminology, but his approach to it was weeds clearly can grow well where you are, you'll get native weeds that do well, so why not get rid of most of them, but maybe just keep one or two, and then they can be very beautiful plants. I'm covered in herb robert for instance but it is the most beautiful oh, oh, definitely there you know weed is in behind the eye of the beholder certainly it really is you know we have an area i've mentioned before on the car park outside where i deliberately encourage them to grow suddenly it's got poppies in it and stuff like that you start to see an ecosystem going as gertrude jekyll once said all plants are welcome in my garden I just want to be able to control whereabouts they are placed. In a way, that's kind of what weeding is, isn't it? Absolutely. Now, other practical things this month. Are your potatoes well earthed up? I don't actually earth potatoes. I know that will sound a bit strange. Nearly everybody around me on the allotment does. But um, because I have this problem with um, horsetail, I, I don't want to bring more root up to the surface by earthing. So I just put them in very, very deep. I put them in about 30 centimetres down. And that means they don't appear for a while, but actually then they come up, the crown comes up quite quickly. It's almost just like they're relieved to get that crown out. But what it tends to mean then is uh, I, I've got such deep planting that I take quite a heavy crop of potatoes. So I'm not saying earth and up is, is a bad thing, but I go very, very deep and I find that works better for me. Uh, that's a good practical tip. I'll try that. But this year I've, <laughs> I've been growing potatoes in bags for life. It, it's an ongoing experiment. I haven't yet dug them up, but it, it was quite a nice way of using up all those bags. That, you know, when you go to a conference, you get given <laughs> yeah. a, a, a yeah, bag. Yeah, you get everywhere you go in life, you get bags, don't exactly. you? Exactly. <laughs> so I put these bags filled with earth and potatoes in my big re black recycling bins and they seem to be doing very well. So I'll let you know how, how what sort of crop I get. They're, um, they're good for it. With the kids, you know, my stuff, I worked in schools, we used to do hessian uh, planting. And what to do is you uh, put some soil in about a quarter, then put your seed potatoes in, cover them over. And as the potatoes start to grow, then you add more soil. So you get potatoes right through the bag. And that, that's a great thing to do as a family exercise. Or if you're in limited space, like a balcony, it's a very, very good thing to do. So what about in your polytunnel? What's going on in there? Well, the secret, I mean, it's because we had that big hot period and, uh, and more's coming, I think, as well, is just to make sure you get the air moving forward. The worst thing you can do in an enclosed space at the moment is let that heat build up. Um, if you do, I've had tomato plants when the leaves start to curl, you can start to see they're worrying about transpiration. Just make sure the doors are open or any vents are open. Same with the greenhouse. Make sure the air is moving through it. Otherwise, you'll find your plants will start to stress. I think also the key about watering in greenhouses and polytunnels is don't overwater and make sure that you don't wet the leaves if possible, because if you do that, there's every chance that you're going to encourage uh, disease infection, that the spores of mold and such like will be able to germinate. So when you water, make sure you're watering the soil and down at the bottom of the plant, not the leaf above. They're very important. Also, if it's very hot, especially through glass, you're going to have to worry about scorching. So you want to make sure that the air is moving through and you're controlling your watering. Talking about watering and, and air circulation, one of the things I've noticed this year is that I've got quite a lot of powdery mildew on my apple trees. 
This, I think, is because the growth on the apple trees has been so luscious. It's almost too thick and too green. And that has stopped there being proper air circulation within the tree and around it. It's not a difficult one to deal with. Just make sure that you cut out any of the end growth, any of the twigs that are showing the powdery mildew. Keep them separate. Don't put them on the compost heap. Keep them separate in a bag or whatever, and then decide what you're going to do with them. Maybe send them to the local council composting collection or maybe burn them. Whatever you find is most appropriate to get rid of those twigs. And in your cutting, you will then automatically open up the tree and get that lovely sense of air flowing through it. And that stops the mildew spreading. It certainly does. That kind of rule, actually, even whether, it, whether it's a small fruit tree or if you're on a boroculturist and you're doing a huge tree, no rubbing or crossing woods. Make sure air can move around the plant, just like us. Plants need air. If it gets over too knotty and over complicated, then they become weakened and then the pest and disease moves in. Yeah, that's so true. And are you growing any green manures, Chris, this year? Well, I'm going for, at recommendation of our friend Anton, trying grounds bean this year. And I'm doing that not to cover the ground that I'm not using, but to underplant my runners and my broads, just because I, you know how much I don't like to see bare soil. And it's uh, been an interesting year for that because because it was such a slow April and May, I was seeing lots of bare soil for quite a while and now everything started to growing and I could see plants starting to cover up and take advantage of their space. I just want to keep that going. So ground beans are legume. We know it fixes nitrogen. It's great to dig in at the end of the season. So I'm going to be underplanting with that. But if you have any spare space, it is a good time to put in green manures, isn't it, Sarah? Well, green manures, I think, are brilliant plants because they are kind of what they say on the tin, that they're, they're, they're plants that actually feed the soil. And that's quite important because this time of year, as you say, you're beginning to get those bare patches. Maybe you're pulling something up, that, um, onions, say, for instance, and you've got that spare earth. Put in a green manure. And if you go to the Garden Organic website, you'll see there's a whole list of green manures that you can choose that you think would be appropriate for your particular patch. I'm trying one this year, which I've not tried before, which is buckwheat. Now is a good time to sow it. It's very rapid growing and its root system takes up phosphate from the soil. And then when you dig it back in, and that's the secret of green manures, you must dig them back in. This phosphate will then be dispersed in the soil after digging in. So it's, it's a kind of win-win situation. The plant is growing, but it's also feeding the soil at the same time. The other joy of buckwheat is that it has very pretty pink flowers and these attract those beneficial insects like bees and hoverflies who will help in turn with the pollination of all your other flowers and fruits. Yeah, they're really, I think they really are a must for the organic garden green manures, aren't they? And, and I noticed so this, you know, as we come into August, July finishes, I know July now, but they come into August, my onions will go over, my garlic will need pulling and I'll suddenly have spaces on the allotment and I might sow some stuff in there or if I wanted to, make sure an area of ground is looked after and the soil's maintained, then I'll start to put in green manures. So different green manures have different properties. Go to the Garden Organic website, search for green manures and see if you can find a way of just incorporating even just one of them into your plot. I think you'd be really pleasantly surprised. Yeah, bare, bare soil is a no-no for us if we can help it. Eh? That's the thing. Um, I'm guessing that you're also mulching. Chris, I know you don't have a lawn, but I do. And I find that using grass cuttings is a brilliant mulch on particularly around perennials. Uh, I don't know, hedges or, or perennial plants that could be drying out this month. If you follow the mantra of weeding, watering and then mulching, you will be locking that moisture in the soil and therefore helping the plant survive what could be a couple of very dry months. Yeah, this really is, uh, I think, an important time. Things like um, aubergine or courgette, things that might be very susceptible during dry, hot weather, might be susceptible to mildews. I always mulch with my own homemade compost around those plants this time of year, just to keep a bit of humidity around them, keep them happy. Our own compost is our black gold, isn't it? Our earthy gold. That's where we see it. And this is, for me, the time of year it really comes into its own. I also tend to also, all my um, pots, my big pots on my balcony will also get a little thin layer of compost on as well. Because I know it'll just bolt them up with nutrients and keep that limited soil a little bit healthy, a little bit sort of the structure of it in, in shape, basically. That's really good, Chris. And I like the way you're using your homemade compost. I'm also cutting my comfrey. 
And comfrey, again, is I know we talk a lot about it, but again, it's one of those magical plants that actually will help you feed your own plants. You can grow it yourself, comfrey. It's very easy to grow. Cut the leaves, soak them in water, and you've got your own homemade, perfectly free fertilizer. And I find that comfrey liquid feed brilliant on my tomatoes in particular. You don't need to go and buy a grow bag for tomatoes. It's a big plastic bag. You don't want that single use plastic. It's full of compost, which you need to check that it, if it's peat free or not. Avoid all of that. Just grow your own comfrey plant, cut it, make your own comfrey liquid feed, and then wherever your tomatoes are planted, now is the time to be feeding them with a liquid feed because now is when they're flowering and fruiting and needing the most amount of nutrients. Yeah, they're, so, they're busy plants at the moment. And I'll tell you what, I have to tell you a little story, the comfrey on my allotment. There's a little clump of it down the bottom and I, it is absolutely alive with bees at the moment. I put my head in near enough in it the other day and it was zzz, It was incredible. <laughs> it really was. And I just think that's just a delightful thing to have in your glowing space. It really is. It's a win-win all round. Yeah, a little bee rave. OK, Chris, <laughs> well, it's lovely to talk to you as ever. I hope the sun continues to shine on you and... Um, <laughs> Have a good time down on your and allotment. Thank you, Sarah and you. Happy gardening. Bye. Bye-bye. And now, I don't know if you visited a garden centre recently, but I thought it would be interesting to look at these retail giants and discuss just how sustainable they are. Do they encourage environmentally friendly gardening? Or are they just a place to buy stylish outdoor furniture and a yummy piece of cake? I'll be speaking with Dr David Beck at Coventry University. David co-authored a report on the sustainability of garden centres and he has a few important tips for the industry on how to become more responsible in an age of environmental emergency. But first, let's join Chris who goes down to Kent to visit a very individual garden centre where the owners have thought through every aspect of how they want to encourage us to spend our money responsibly and keep the retail experience sustainable. Well, it's a lovely sunny day and I'm down in Faversham in Kent and I'm with Chris and David who are running Edible Culture Garden Centre, which is uh, amazing. In fact, I was in a garden centre yesterday, um, one of the mainstream ones, and the feel is very different here. I don't feel like I'm being bombarded by advertising and plastic. It looks very natural. There's lots of plants around me. Obviously, there's lots of sustainable practices going on here. I'm going to start with Chris at the compost area, which looks really interesting. Tell me a bit about this. Oh, hi there. Yeah, so as a, as a business, we pride ourselves on using peat-free only compost. But the way we sell it is very different to a lot of other garden centres. So rather than sell it in pre-packaged single-use plastic bags, we do it in a bag for life scheme. It's a bit like a shopping bag, yeah. but it's in a compost reusable bag. So we shovel it from a bulk amount into, the, into this reusable bag and then the customer uh, then brings the bag back next time they need compost we refill it and there's nothing to dispose of so it's repeat compost by quick repeat yeah. so you get you keep the customers that way as well don't you yeah so you know quite often we we walk around the town when, when we're kind of going home and we see the bags in front gardens and it's kind of that that link between people coming coming to us because they they know that they can get something quite simply compost being a kind of obviously a core thing that people need to garden <laughs> actually doing it in a very simple way that has less or no no packaging at all yeah it's quite interesting because i think a lot of people buy compost compost on mass and then don't use half of it or end up throwing it away or you know that kind of so you're actually buying exactly what you need in this system as well aren't you yes people people come in and they might just need a top up of a bag and then we can do that for them a, a lot of what we do is really about people buying as and when they need so if they want to come up regularly and buy bits and pieces that's fine it's, it's a really nice way of doing it actually. brilliant yeah it's very impressive and so could tell me a little bit more about the garden center because obviously you're, you're big into your plants i can see a lot of plants here well we, we specialize in edibles predominantly herbs fruit trees and veg we propagate basically most of the stock that we grow on site bar things like fruit trees which you don't have the space to do mm -hmm. like before but we work with nurseries in the uk that have similar principles to ourselves and we try and specialize in lots of different unusual varieties big choice and also things that people can grow that help with biodiversity gain as well in their garden right so wildflowers that kind of stuff yeah, is it yeah a, yeah. Lot, a lot of herbs that that uh, provide a lot of flowers and that people can grow them in, in amongst other plants. So they're not yeah. having to create so, some traditional veg gardens. They can do a more of an organic kind of... So it's that big organic rule about a diverse site, basically. I practice it on my allotment, so I don't want just rows of lettuce and rows of this. You're mixing things up. Like almost potaging, isn't it? That kind of style of mixing everything together. Actually, it's quite interesting because, because we don't use any pesticides or any chemicals at all on site. We're not ashamed to show people 
I don't know, some aphid on a tree that we may have and actually show the natural predatorial action going on because it gets people into the mindset of actually they can grow stuff without thinking they've got to buy chemicals, they've got to buy all this this and that to actually garden in, in sort of tune with nature and that's really important to us. Seeing that close up I suppose because I think people think they see a pest and they panic don't they and then yeah. it's, that's when the pesticides come out and so you're giving them that window into how nature works aren't you? Yeah, yes. yeah that's what we're trying to do and, and, and not not trying to be pristine and perfect and yes have the kind of element of what a garden centre is in terms of trying to sell things in a nice displayed way but also trying to be very I suppose the word is rustic. Yeah, about. very relaxed, isn't it? It's a, it's a shared space. That's the way to look at it, isn't it, I suppose? You, yeah. That's what you're trying to encourage. With the fact we've got some garden space here, with the idea being that there's certain plants that we put and establish in yeah. the ground so we, people can see the context of the size and the shape of those plants a bit easier on site. It was very interesting you saying that because I think having that knowledge inside the garden centre, because I go to a lot of garden centres and two things happen to me. One, people approach me and ask me questions because I might look like I know what I'm oh, doing. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is... It, we, we've not been very good at training in horticulture, so I think there's a massive need for people to go into garden and actually speak to experts. Yeah. Uh, and, and what we've seen is a huge demand over the last year, primarily because people are at home more and they've got the time. And, but people have really connected with nature and people are much more aware of the climate emergency. So, and horticulture is kind of on the front line of that. Uh. Because, you know, if we're going to plant millions of trees, if we're going to plant hedges, if we're, horticulture is at the heart of that. But, I mean, obviously we're a very small part of that, but what we're trying to give people the time when they come in is to actually talk to them. You can do all of this. You can make some sort of positive contribution in a small way. Well, I'll tell you one thing I want to about. I'll just say again, I'm looking out onto this beautiful setup here. Lots of plants, you compost. But you do loose seed as well. I'm really interested in that. Can I, can I yeah. have a look at that? Yeah, sure. Oh, look at this. Wow, this is fantastic. Now, just for the listeners, I've got a series of wooden boxes is here divided up with loose seed in it. We've got some, some beans here. Oh, they're such beautiful seeds. So I really like this because so you just come on and literally like pick a mix, is it? Yes. Um, we, we buy the seed in, in, a, in a bulk form, in, 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 which actually is cheaper. So it means that we can sell it at a much better value for the customer. And people can literally buy as much or as little as they want. And we do it by weight or individual seed if, if it's a bigger seed. And, and that's, that's been very popular. I mean, we still sell packet seeds, but actually you know doing it this way means that people can put buy just what they need yeah it's very beautiful to look at and i think you're right sometimes you know i buy a packet of seeds and there's 300 seeds in here yeah. where i only need 10 and yeah. so you kind of get a lot of variation plus also a lot of it's coming from china and places yeah. like that so you're obviously aware of your carbon footprint with seeds as well yeah yes yeah, so we, we work with various companies um that grow good quality seed sometimes i would try and get organic as much as possible it's sometimes more more challenging but um, in terms of um, the companies we work with or, or buy from, they're, they're, they have a similar ethos to us. So, yeah, we're buying, you know, British grown seed, but minimal packaging. And the packaging we do get them in is either paper we can recycle or it's something we can recycle that the consumer might not be able to. So, again, they're putting their loose seeds into a paper bag, yeah, yeah. which they can then compost the bags. People can come here without having to feel that they have to buy something in plastic packaging that they then have to dispose of. Yes, it's incredible. So, I mean, I was handling seed yesterday, and you not only do you get the, the, the seed packet highly printed in colour print, then you get a plastic label inside with a picture yeah, of the plant on yeah. it. So you, it kind of, and then you get another packet yeah, inside of that. Yeah. So it is, the package is incredibly heavy. And what's interesting is that I would be tempted to buy seed looking at these because they're so beautiful. The yeah. beans and stuff are just yeah. they, they're, before they've even started the yeah. game. They're so wonderful to look at. It's like being in a sweet shop and people that love gardening, a bit like myself. I'd, I, 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 I would see this and it would it, literally, you know, it fill my heart. It, you know, people come in who've got like a, the tiniest garden, they might only want 10 onion sets just to put in a pot because they fancy growing yeah. them. They don't have to buy a bag of 200. Exactly. And then then you'd have to find someone to give it to or throw them away. It means that there's, a, there's less waste for them and it's cheaper for them. And actually, it's still viable for us because we can still make a profit on selling these things. And I think also you've got to remember now, nowadays, it's saying I'm from obviously London. Half the people in London don't have gardens. They have balconies, this kind of stuff. Yeah. And even new builds, your average new builds four before. And even gardens with quite poor soil. So they need something they can grow in raised beds or containers or window boxes and things like that. And I mean, we try and encourage people to do it. And even just growing a couple of bean plants or a couple of onions, it's just, it's that kind of joy of seeing Yeah, it is that where you get the bug. You yeah. become a part of it. It becomes yeah. a part of you. Yeah. And I think also, you're right, we can't individually change the world, but lots of littles make a lot, don't they? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. We talked to a lot of people about how growing something has just, it, it really helped them during particularly the last sure. year when it's been very depressing times. 
So, and I, I value that because I come here every day and I, it really kind of... It lifts your mood as soon as you're exactly. in the door, yeah. You know, just, just, just being able to grow something, feel like you're doing something positive, it's mm. really nice. And you've got also, I'm going to quickly describe this room because I love this. It reminds me a little bit of my old Parks days when you used to have the old Bothy and there would always be stuff to look at yeah. in it and that kind of, it's really got that feel to it. So the pots and that, but you've also got these little chambers down the bottom here of feeds and gravel and grit. So you're really going across the range of this kind of being able to help what you, the, the amount you need into a paper bag, take it away. Yeah, yeah so when, when, we, when we made the bold decision to be basically sell everything without single-use plastic, because we were going to sort of start looking at certain areas, but we decided to do everything and just actually go go for it. We we needed to find solutions for the different things that people asked for. So the, the, the plant feeds here, the dried feeds like bone meal, things like that, you know, we can buy in bulk and we can sell it loose. Trugs, low, yeah. old wooden trugs, yeah. all, you know, that. You know, tools that are good quality, but again, you know, made sustainably. So we try and work with local companies, or British companies, in the sense of more for the fact that, you know, we, there's that traceability of supplies. They're not made the other side of the world out of unsustainable materials, for example. I and mean, clearly we can't get it 100% perfect, but... But no, but you still, yeah, it's that, like you say, that effort you're making. Yeah, absolutely. We've just got to, we've got to be honest and genuine and talk to people about our passion for what we do. One thing that's really interesting is the paper pot thing you do. Oh, yes. It's called Posse Pot. Posse Pot, that's yeah, it. What a proper name. <laughs> Excellent. Posse Pot um, was, was another solution to our plastic problem. So we grow all our plants in plastic pots because it still is the best thing to grow something in for the length of time we need to grow it in in the nursery but what we don't really want to do is give that plastic to the, the customer who has no recycling for them so what we did is we, we looked at all the sizes we predominantly grow our plants in and we created a, a cardboard it's almost a cardboard sleeve that when we sell a plant we take the plant out of the plastic and put it into this cardboard pot and then people can take that home with no plastic at all they can plant the plant actually in the cardboard in the grounds because it can rot. so you don't even have to knock the pot out no they can take it out if they want to um we're keeping the the waste within the industry it's within minimal our, yeah because yeah. plastic pots is a real problem isn't it because they they get everywhere the thing it's about how we use the plastic afterwards isn't it so everything you've got here you recycle you wash it it goes back into the system it, it, exactly and it, it, it changes the because people buy into it and people love it we've actually had more sales because of it because people say i want to come and buy a plant in that lovely pot yeah it breaks that kind of plant through the till churning it through it so yeah. you're hit ticking all these boxes yeah it's not a good expression really but you're, yeah. you know your sustainability lack of you not so much plastic but also that customer service yeah. i mean it's coming across very strongly for me being here that that's very important to you yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely and most people might come in and not quite understand because it's mm. not what they expect from a garden center but once they kind of understand why we do it the way we do, people yeah. then, you know, get it and they kind of actually think, well, maybe, you know, maybe garden centres should be a bit like this and a bit a bit different. So it, it gets people thinking. Yeah, brilliant. So I'm now in the office. Um, place to start here, I think, is how did, how did this all begin? What, what, what inspired this amazing setup? Once, once I finished university, I, I, I've always had a longing to do my own business. Yeah. The, the obvious thing was a horticultural business, but, but I wanted to do something a bit different. I, the, the previous company I worked for was, uh, was, was dealing with fruit propagation, fruit trees, the home of the National Fruit Collection. Yeah, so sure Kent, the we're in Kent, aren't we? Um, yeah. So, so that, that, that combination of edibles and, and growing things was where really edible culture formulated. It really sort of defines what we do in the name. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, five years later, and we're sort of here now with with a shop and a, and a sort of business that is is become really successful. On right. The back of so this interest in sustainability and environmentalism, that that that, where was that born? And have you always had that interest, both you and David? Yes, we both love growing things, and we both love nature, and we both love the connection between growing things and the benefit it has to to people and 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 the environment. And I think. We, we both knew that when we when we started off doing what we do, we wanted to do it well and we wanted to do it in a way that wasn't creating any sort of significant damage to the environment. So, all, all, you know, albeit at the beginning, we did it very conventionally. You know, we, we, we bought compost the way anyone else does. And we, we, we although we always had peat free and chemical free approach because we both felt that that was really important. But as time's gone on, we've started to identify the other things within the business that, right. that actually we feel is could be tackled. It, it, it's been partly down to, to demand. So customers actually talking, us talking to customers saying, oh, it'd be great to be able to buy things like this. And so, so listening to what our, what, what our customer base want. Obviously, as, as business grows, you get a bit more finance to be able to So I was going to ask, I was going to say, is it, I mean, I've worked in retail. It's always quite a fine line, yeah. isn't it? You know, obviously, especially if you're buying stuff localised, does it tend to be more expensive? To, to a degree. I mean, certain things like, you know, buying in bulk can be cheaper. 
uh, as in the way we, if we decant it and sell it loose, that can be a cheaper way of buying it. When you when you work with a, a local or, or say British company that say still make things traditionally, it's always going to be more expensive than mass produced products. But then we, we we're not shy to say to people it's this price because it's you know you're investing in something really good. So it's it's, it's almost people people that come here kind of ex, expect us to, to have products that are in that vein. They're not they're not we're not we're not buying in just cheap stuff for the sake of the fact we want to make more money. It's more about actually, us actually buying stuff that we feel is the right thing. To sure, buy. sure. So it's, it's a di- it is an odd one when you're trying to make money. So it's, I mean you mentioned interesting there because. Obviously, a lot of garden, pesticides and, and artificial fertilizers are, are a huge profit, aren't they, for the industry? Yeah. So you're kind of like knocking that out of the equation straight away, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, I mean, what, what we try and do is, it's almost, it's a, sometimes it seems counterproductive. Sometimes someone will come in and they might say, oh, my plant isn't looking very good. And being a salesperson, we could go, oh, you need this feed, you need this chemical, and we could sell them a ton of stuff. But actually, sometimes we, we almost talk people out of buying something. We don't <laughs> think it's the right thing to do. Because quite brave, really, isn't it, in a way, I suppose. And with a consumer, it's quite interesting there. It can end up being a race to the bottom, and the provider, the the, the business is selling to the consumer, can obviously go for that angle as well. It's a very easy option, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So you're just quite brave to do it, and that's yeah. why I'm quite interested. It's interesting to see it working so yeah. well. And yeah, there are times where probably if you went to a, a traditional garden centre, they may be busier than we are. As long as we're not making a loss, yeah, and we know we're doing something right. You're not looking to be multi-millionaires out no. of it. You're, you no. just want, you know, enough is enough. You yeah. want to take what you need and no yeah. more, and that's kind yeah. of. You're, you're obviously your theory, you're practicing horticulture as well, isn't yeah. it? The two worlds meet. Um, and I think that people will want to know more about it. And I think that you'll be setting the, the, the example for, for more people in the future, yeah. definitely. Well, if anybody's in the area and you want to come and meet Chris and David, I'm sure they'll be glad to see you. And I'd want to appreciate very much you talking to me today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm now with Dr. David Beck. And what I'd like to do first is put this inspiring garden centre into context. David, how big is the garden centre business in the UK? Okay, well, there are around 2,000 garden centres and plant nurseries in the UK. And if you align their sales with um, those of some of the sort of multiple retailers who also sell garden products, you're looking at about seven and a half billion pounds a year in turnover for garden products. Through and seven and a half billion, not seven, million, billion. Billion, yeah, billion, yeah, um, which is obviously a very substantial sum. Um, the majority isn't through garden centres as we know them. It's actually through through the retailers. They they take about sixty percent of uh, of all the all the trade. And I'd also heard that the average individual spend in the garden during lockdown year was seven hundred pounds. That's you and me spending on average £700 over the past year. Indeed, yeah. I mean, there's been all kinds of statistics that have come out, but the the overall message has been that, uh, yeah, that people spent quite a lot of money on their gardens because there wasn't much else to do. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely been a lot of new gardeners there. I've seen, you know, as a, as a sort of phenomena being talked about in the horticultural trade press. So we're talking big... Big, big money here. But can we think about the impact of this on the in, on the natural environment? Of course, yes. I mean, undoubtedly, all this activity is definitely going to have impacts on the environment. Our initial instinct would be to think, oh, thank goodness, people are buying plants um, and doing other things that are pro-wildlife, like buying bird food or whatever. And we would imagine instantly that that would be, you know, a net gain for the environment. But it's just not that simple. We are encouraged to buy bird food, but it's always in plastic bags. We're encouraged to buy compost, potting media, but again, it's in a single-use plastic bag. Yes, so, I mean, these are exactly many of the um, conundrums that confront us as consumers when we go into garden centres. I, I do sometimes wonder about sort of like the younger consumers who are more, if you like, switched on, who allegedly have got into gardening a lot in the last year as something to do during lockdown, quite what they think when they walk into an average garden centre and you just walk through the shelves of red bottles that are selling isides, things that kill. The plastic issue, of course, again, completely goes against the the trend since Attenborough's uh, Blue Planet documentary, where so many people have been concerned about these issues. And like you say, there you go, you pick up your, your bag of bird food, which is supposed to be good for biodiversity amongst the bird population, according to the RSPB research. And then what do you do with the bag? You look at the back of it and it says not yet recyclable, as though the yet is somehow or another some little cheering up point that it might be at some point in the future. But that's of no use to anybody. It needs to be recyclable now. 
The compost is a very interesting one because, yes, again, you've shuddered to think how many bags a year are ending up in landfill as a result. I mean, it must be running into the tens, hundreds of, of thousands. You do sometimes see on the bags, you know, comments like locally recyclable. But again, as a consumer, that's of little value because how do you know if a compost bag is recyclable for you? Or it may say recyclable in some stores. How do you find that out? There's no other information to know what you could do if you want to be a more active consumer. Yeah, so these things are very challenging. So many of these products, either in their manufacture and their supply chains, generate negative impacts. And and then the way that gardening is actually practiced can also have a lot of negative impacts as well. Gardening could be and should be such a force for good. It should be a positive contributor to carbon footprints, to even water footprints in, in local areas. Um, and definitely to biodiversity, you know, if it's done properly. And I think that's one of the tricks the industry is missing, is really looking at how to bolster all those particular metrics within the industry. As an academic, you have a great understanding of the circular economy, um, which perhaps you could explain in simple terms, but also how you think it can be applied to garden centre retail. It's just all around things like reducing use of resources. It's about reusing resources. It's about recycling. I mean, that rather than having a linear economy where a resource is extracted and ultimately ends up in landfill, i.e. it's wasted, we have a circular process where those resources are kept in use for as long as possible, if not infinitely, and therefore that reduces the burden on the planet. So in a garden centre context, that could be the manufacturer of the bag coming in. Is it made from virgin materials for plastic? And then is it recyclable afterwards? And unfortunately, we're finding that it's a fail at both ends. There's not enough recycled material being used, partly, I believe, because the strength of material you need you know, exceeds that that most recyclable plastics can manage, I've been told by people in the growing media industry. So, yeah, the, these are big problems and they do need to be tackled sooner rather than later. I like the way you refer to the circular economy. And I also query the whole terminology of sustainability. Now, sustainability in business terms, we know, means basically to make a profit. So you sustain your your presence in the business world. But of course, sustainability to the gardener or to an individual is more about not taking more than the natural environment can absorb. So there is enough for future generations. How do you think garden centres can resolve this tension? They are a retail operation after all. Oh, indeed. Yes. And I mean, and true sustainability um, involves meeting the economic, the social and the environmental criteria. Nothing is sustainable unless you can tick all three of those uh, those boxes. That's the people, uh, planet, profit. Boxes, that, that's that it. Right? Yes. Because at the end of the day, if you're just making a profit in the short term, but damaging the environmental society, that's not sustainable. And then there are those who will say, well, if you're just looking after the environment, but you're not ensuring that people have got jobs, then that's not sustainable for the human race. So it's all about how you balance those those different tensions. And as you say, you can reduce that to the level of the garden centre who needs to stay in business. But the wider world is moving fast and there's actually going to there is a need for garden centres and other similar businesses to really grasp this particular nettle and to look at ways of promoting doing the right thing. And the the horticulture industry needs to be much more aggressive and proactive in actually saying, how can it set itself as one of the leading sustainable types of industry and business? And it should do, because it's got the the best selling points you can possibly have um, in terms of uh, terms of its product. And I think that there is a there is a move by consumers in this general direction. You know, some of the research from particularly the last year has shown that more consumers are now more interested in environmental and sustainability issues. The pandemic has, you know, really driven home the message that we are all interconnected through nature. I think the old business as usual model isn't satisfactory and there's no reason why proactive businesses shouldn't really do very well. I wonder if one of the solutions would be if the garden centre retail could be more in touch with the horticultural side of what they're doing. In other words, if they could work closely with horticultural colleges and encourage them to be involved in the retail. And so you would have staff, for instance, who were trained horticulturists just as in edible culture, they spent quite a lot of time with customers talking about the plants, even showing them the aphids on the plants to talk about credit, pest and predator circular role. Don't you feel there could be a better link there? 
Yes, I think that anything that improves the flow of information um, and education is absolutely critical. But of course, you've got to have horticulturalists who are coming from a sustainability standpoint, not just a productivity standpoint. So I think what you're talking about there is actually looking at the whole training process for horticulturalists to ensure that uh, sustainability is built into the whole training system so that the people coming through really understand the necessity for doing these things and how you can still actually have completely just as productive a horticulture in more organic or more sustainable ways as you can with the high input methods. Let's just finish by, I'm going to ask you what advice you would give to the individual gardener. I assume it's not boycott the garden centre, but maybe something a little bit more positive that, than that in how to engage with it. Yeah, well, I think <clears throat> I think with all these things, it is about self-education. It's about asking questions, you know, when you're in garden centres. because, And it's actually about going to the garden centres that do it better as well, if you're able to. And I think one of the things that's very striking, if you go to a cross-section of garden centres, is how differently they present themselves and the information they provide. And as one not far from where I live in rugby, where I've I walked in and, and I just thought, gosh, you wouldn't think that, you know, that green was on the agenda or anything in the wider world because there was literally nothing that, that spoke in that way. Um, whereas you can go to other garden centres and there's a very large one somewhere in the sort of Cheshire, Manchester region I was in a couple of years ago and doing some research. And they, they just the way they labelled the shelves and the kind of information they had available. You know, it was all about the bees. It was about the water. They were, it was about peat free. You know, they made sure that the consumer was getting the messages as they walked round. You know, those kind of direct and subliminal messages were all there. And I think that's just really important. And it, it's things as well, like just looking at the layout. I remember going in again into another garden centre. And if you wanted to find the peat free compost, you'd literally got to walk about 50 yards further than for all the others because it was tucked away right in the corner out of the way. Um, and then I went to another garden centre in Oxfordshire a few weeks ago and virtually all the growing media was peat free. And that was a very big, clearly huge turnover garden centre with a very mainstream audience. And they clearly have a market for it. Again, there you could see very distinct messaging. And I think that's the, one of the crucial things. So the consumer needs to play a role in making active choices. I don't think that's always very easy because a lot of these choices are hidden from your view. Um, for example, go to um, compost and quite often you don't even know what's in it. Some of the brands don't tell you. So, yeah, it, it's, it's not an easy one. And I think definitely though, those consumers who are interested and concerned need to be making their point known and they've got to put their pounds in the right place and ask questions. And because, you know, money is the thing that will drive change in, in the sector more than anything else. Thank you, David. That really helped put it all in a business context. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure to join the podcast. Well, I'm sure you too have thoughts on this interesting topic. I would agree with David. The power of the pound in our pocket is probably what will drive change in the industry. Here at Garden Organic, we're proud to spearhead the peat-free compost campaign. And we know that organic gardeners everywhere are doing their bit to support the wildlife around us. The Garden Centre Association say... Gardening is a force for good in the population's mental and physical health. I think we'd all agree with that. But, almost as an afterthought, they add, and also for the environment. Maybe we should just hold them to that. Well, now it's time to open the post bag. Chris and I are joined by our friend and garden organic colleague, Anton. Hi, Anton. Hello, Sarah. How's your garden looking at the moment? Well, to be honest, it's a bit of a mixed bag at the moment. Um, some things are growing OK now. I've got a nice load of lettuces and chard. That's looking good. But some things are really, really behind. We've had such a cold period in May. And um, when I look at my pictures on Facebook from last year, I can see that tomatoes are probably look almost about six weeks ahead compared to what they are now. So everything's quite a bit behind. It's all part of that gardening challenge, isn't it, Anton? It is. <laughs> It'll all come good in the end. OK, so we've got three really good questions this month. And I'll kick off with the first one from a listener in Oxfordshire. I had bad luck with many of my seeds this year. Some never germinated and some were eaten completely by slugs. Is it too late to start again? And what would you recommend sowing this month? 
Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's been a bit of an interesting year for seed sowing because some things have worked, like uh, Anton said there, a bit of a mixed bag, and other things have been very, very slow, obviously, because a really sort of strange April where it was very dry and then a cold, wet May. A lot of stuff that I've sown has grown, but not to the same extent I'd normally find it would do. So things like aubergines I grow and peppers have all sat very, very small. Other things I've found that like the lettuces have grown okay, but I think a big important rule is if you, as long as you get through that bit, you can carry on sowing. I know things are changing now in July, but if you sow stuff late, don't worry, and it's sitting small, it will grow on. I am now at the moment putting in some turnips and some swedes. They're quite good to go, but it's not time to finish sowing yet, is it, Anton? No, there's st still plenty of things that you can grow. I mean, obviously you can continue to successionally so lettuce there's always time to do that right the way up to the end of August and there are some things which actually will grow better when sown now so a lot of the oriental greens and um, things like your mizunas and mustards and um, pat choy and things that will actually grow better if you sow it later in the season because when you sow it early it just tends to bolt really really quickly and it also gets ravaged by flea beetles so sowing it now is actually a pretty good thing to be be doing um, also, broad beans, quite a nice thing. People always assume you have to sow them early, but if you sow some now, you will actually get a pretty nice autumn crop off them. So that would be an added bonus. That's a really good tip, Anton, because I think actually other sorts of beans, it's not too late to sow them now and that you should get a crop in September. Let's assume we're going to have a lovely warm autumn. French beans and runner beans, I mean, they come up so quickly that, you know, you can be planting them out in a few weeks. So, yeah, they'll do OK as well. If they're warm and watered, they will definitely put on growth quite quickly, won't they, if the conditions are favourable. I noticed we mentioned slugs there, though, because I have a little bit of fun with them. And I've kind of found, well, during those damp, wet days, just to get out with the tongs and bag them and remove them somewhere else has really helped. I've, I've noticed that you kind of get these sudden rushes attacking younger plants. I think that's the time to be very observant. I suppose also where slugs are concerned, it may be an idea rather than sowing directly into the ground to sow into trays or pots and wait until the plant is more mature, more strong, more tough in itself, and then put it out into the soil that will probably avoid the worst of the slug attack because the slugs go for that very luscious young growth, don't they? They do indeed. Yeah, I'd go with that. I always tend to sow things in pots and trays first, if possible. OK, that's great. Thanks, guys. Now, this next question really strikes a chord with me. I'm going away and I feel bad about leaving my plants. What tips would you give to help them survive? Well, I particularly sympathise with this listener because maybe it's the mother in me, but going away and leaving all your carefully raised plants is a real wrench. You almost long for cool, wet weather to keep them safe, which, of course, is not the weather you want when you go on holiday. Um, Chris, what do you do if you have to be away from your plot for some time? <laughs> I, I always go on holiday in the winter, Sarah. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I can't. I can't leave things behind in the summer. On for, yeah, as, as a gardener as well, doing it because I do it for a living. I'll, I have to be here anyway, so I tend to go in the way in the winter. But I understand. That's not for everyone, especially at the moment. Everyone's been cooped up because of COVID and stuff. Everyone will be dying to go away and I understand that. So there are a few tricks. Obviously, I have um, a high intensity for watering out my balcony. I have a lot of baskets out there. So you can't just leave those. You just, they'll just, you'll just lose them. So one of the little tricks I do is I tend to get old water bottles and I cut the top off. And then I tend to wrap lots of cling film around the, the mouthpiece. And I put pinpricks in that, fill them with water and that will gradually release its irrigation its water into the pots that's one thing you can do i will do that on the allotment a little bit as well to be honest with you around things like tomatoes if i wasn't there just slow irrigation if you can't go to all that fluff then you, there's actually stuff on the market which will do that sort of small taps you can fit to bottles that will release water very very slowly house plants is another issue for me because obviously I'm, my house is full of plants the older the older plants the bigger rubber plants cheese plants ficus that kind of stuff I don't worry so much about them. They'll get through two weeks. But the smaller stuff, begonias, the more sensitive stuff, I'll fill my bath up with water and I'll sit them all there in the, for two weeks and they tend to do all right in there. They tend to hang on until I get back. That's great, Chris. Good good tips. What about you, Anton? Do you go away in the summer? Not normally, but um, we have had the occasion. I remember a couple of years ago, we went away in June and, and we had all these runner bean plants and it was really a time to either say 
put them in or, or, or leave them. And putting them in the soil was definitely the right thing to do because obviously they can then get their roots down. But what we also did was we made sure that we mulched the soil really thoroughly to keep the moisture in. So we gave it a good soaking and then we put a layer of straw and then a layer of newspaper on top. And the soil was still damp when we came back. The beans really looked, looked well because we happened to be living in a place where our neighbours weren't that cooperative and wouldn't have come and watered. So not everyone always has the sort of fortune of good neighbours. That always is obviously a good thing to do if you can. If you've got good neighbours, get on good terms with them and then you can take it in turns to water while you're while you're away. Same on allotments as well. There's some sense of camaraderie that we, you sort of help to look after each other's plants. I have quite a few plants on my patio area and I made a point of gathering them all together and moving them out of the sun and into a shady corner. And that prevented that drying out from the hot sun. I think that's another good thing. It's interesting that you both talked about watering, uh, which of course can be an issue, but I also think it's about protecting the plant. So in July, for instance, you're going to, your brassicas should might well be away, your peas will be coming on, your strawberries. These are all things that if you don't make sure they're well protected, then birds and other pests will come along and strip them in your absence. So make sure your netting and your mesh is fixed firmly and that will protect your precious plants. All we need now is all the weeds to go on holiday as well, and we'll be sorted, won't we? Because <laughs> they'll still be growing, I know they will. <laughs> That's the joy of coming back from holiday. Yes, is it? There you go, you can just burn off all that excess you've uh, you've got up to when you've been set on holiday, isn't it? Good way. Don't, who needs a gym? Just go weeding, be fine. Well, thank you for the person who sent that in. I hope you have a lovely holiday and don't worry about your plants. I'm sure they will survive. Okay, now we're on to our final question. Is it true the carrot fly can't fly? Anton? That's not strictly true. I would class them as lazy flyers. They don't like to fly more than about two feet above the ground or 60 centimetres. Okay, Anton, just before we discuss the flying habits of the carrot fly, tell us a little bit about the carrot fly and perhaps the damage it can do if you if you haven't encountered one before. Okay, so carrot fly is, is a pretty unremarkable fly. It's um, slightly smaller than a house fly, but bigger than an aphid. It's, it's, you probably never even noticed them, um, but the damage is done by the young ones, the larvae, and when it lays its eggs, they, the larvae hatch out and then they cause lots of sort of small holes in your carrots. Really, they can render them inedible. You might think you're not too worried about a few holes in your carrots but actually when you end up with quite a few of them it not only makes holes in your carrots but the area around where the holes are tends to taste bitter as well because the carrot puts out sort of special compounds to try and deter the pests so sort of you end up with very little to eat basically and it's quite a widespread problem. So Anton how would you prevent the carrot fly getting at your carrots? There's a number of number of ways. Carrot fly is quite a lazy flyer. It doesn't fly above two feet. So you can put a barrier of mesh around your carrots, just really fasten it with a, with a few canes. It needs to be fine mesh because otherwise they'll, they'll get through sort of wide mesh netting. Bas basically that will pr protect them or you can put the mesh right over the carrots and completely cover them with and we can put some hoops to support them. To be honest I find that easier that's what I tend to do with my my carrots we just got a frame that's built and we can just lift it on and off. You do actually need to be quite vigilant like if you're weeding your carrots and you go away to have, have your lunch or something, put the barrier back on because they do tend to sneak in at any opportunity. So make sure that you're quite vigilant. I read somewhere that because the, fly, the carrot fly can't fly very high, you could actually grow your carrots, say, in a deep box, but up on a table. Do you think that would work? Yeah, that works as well. You can grow them in, in containers. Didn't the Victorians, or they were quite famous for growing uh, carrots in raised areas, weren't they, because of carrot fly? But I'm also, you mentioned about, um, Anton, about some sites it's more prolific than others. My last allotment site, there was lots of it. In fact, people didn't grow carrots because of it. This one I'm on now, 
there's much less. If you know they're there, then obviously you can take precautions, like making sure you remove any damaged foliage or any thinned out seedlings, because the scent of a carrot will attract them, won't it? The ferret, there's a pheromone that will bring them in if uh, if damaged carrot foliage is around. So if you know they're present, that can lead to you being able to take precautions. That's right. But to be honest, if you if you know they're there, I really would put a barrier on them because that's the only way of really reliably keeping them out. It's interesting you talk about the scent, Chris. There is a theory that if you grow onions near carrots, that will deter the fly because it won't. the onion smell will stop the fly from being able to smell the carrot. Actually, research has proved that this doesn't really work. I mean, the minimum you would need is four rows of onions either side of your carrots. But even then, the carrot will fly, will still find a way through. I think if you had rows of onions and you and you didn't want any bare soil between them, then it wouldn't harm to interplant with carrot and you'll get both, hopefully. That's maybe the only way around it. Yeah, there's no, no harm in planting them together, but don't expect it to completely cure your carrot fly problem. OK, that's been really interesting. I've learned more about the carrot fly than I think I knew. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next month. Thanks, Cheers. Sarah. Bye-bye. Well, I hope the dreaded carrot fly doesn't come your way. That's all we've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed listening. And don't forget, if there's anything you want to follow up on that you've heard us discuss today, then go to the Garden Organic website. That's gardenorganic.org.uk. Why not check out becoming a member? You'll enjoy our dedicated gardening advice team, get our magazine, and you'll help us spread the organic word. It's also a great present for anyone you know who loves growing the organic way. Next month, we give Anton free reign with the fascinating topic of biocontrols and biostimulants. These are the truly organic approach to boosting your plant's health the natural way. I can't wait to hear it. Until then, have a glorious July. I hope you find time to sit back and enjoy your growing space. Maybe like me, you'll be picking tomatoes and enjoying that first bowl of homegrown strawberries. Bye for now. Our thanks to the Organic Catalogue for sponsoring us and to Kevin McLeod for the music.